Hello and welcome to These Are the Days of Our Podcast, Season 2. I'm Jen. And I'm Lisa. And today we're celebrating Mount Everest. Woohoo! Today's theme is Mount Everest, which is celebrated roughly now-ish and the past two months. So perfect. (laughs) Yes, it's because there's a couple reasons why we're talking about Mount Everest. Do you want to enlighten us? It is the start of season two, and we really wanted to do a Mount Everest episode, and the first summit was May 29th, but, like, climbing season runs until mid-June, and then, like, all the big hitters, you know, Edmund Hillary, George Mallory, Tenzing Norgay, born May, June, July. So it's like it was meant to be. Yeah, and we're just going to hike up this mountain together because we want to. That was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you've tuned in yeah. for. Just the most strained and awkward transitions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is like a complete side note because obviously we can't make like personal anecdotes about climbing Mount Everest because we've never done it. But have you ever read the book Above All Things? Oh my God. It's so beautiful. So it's about George Mallory's wife. It's obviously fictional, but it's like about his wife in England who, receiving his letters, which are obviously super delayed. And then like, spoiler alert, I think everyone knows this. He dies on Everest. And it's just the beautiful love story told through these like fictional letters. Oh my God, it's the best novel. Such a good novel. That sounds really amazing. That. That's like my only personal anecdote about Mount Everest. Well, my personal anecdote is pandemic related. Because at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were all just so young and naive and thought we would do things like remain physically active and not just sit on the couch and eat chocolate, uh, my sister and I decided to do what was called the Everest Challenge, where you go up and down the stairs of whatever stairs you have available to you. So I was going up and down the stairs in my apartment building to the climbing distance that it would be to be equivalent to Everest. And obviously we're not climbing Everest and we're not at altitude and all of that. So I didn't think this was going to be hard, but it was really, really hard. Every single day I'd have to do a couple of hours of stair climbing and it was genuinely very difficult. And I don't think I even got better at climbing stairs. But I did listen to the Into Thin Air audiobook while I was doing that. If we're oh, on the on the topic of of book recommendations, so I would also recommend that. Yeah, that is a great book. I mean, he's an OG Everest lover. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, why don't you just tell us a little bit about Mount Everest then? Yeah. So my assignment was to research some of the history of Mount Everest. In a way, it's a little bit weird to research the history of a mountain because the mountains have just been there for a long time. But how long do you think mountains have been? Well, around? Everest specifically was apparently formed 55 million years ago. So I feel like that's oh. quite a while. What if you believe in Jesus? How then long it's ago? about just over 6,000 years old. You know, either oh, okay, or. Okay, got it. So, Probably 55 million years ago. And it was formed when the Indian continental plate crashed into Asia. It was such a violent crash that the Indian plate pushed under the Asian plate and it raised the landmass upwards and that created the whole Himalayan mountain range. That's cool. Yeah. Where is Mount Everest? So most people think of Everest, they think of Nepal. Because one of the main routes of access is through Nepal. But Everest also is in Tibet, which is under Chinese rule. 
there is an access route to the summit through the north side as well. Yeah, just like less climbed Mm -hmm. because of the political issues. Yes. Going back in the history, we're really leapfrogging several million years. Okay, so we're at 55 and now we're moving to like... Now we're moving to like maybe the 1800s. Oh, okay. Pretty good. Pretty good. So, like, I mean, it's been there for a while. Yeah. And I don't really have a lot of history from 55 million years ago until 200 years ago. So, I apologize, but that's just the limits of my Wikipedia. was there. And I think people saw it and just loomed in the distance. Yes. So, I do think that you will see that we love Everest, but we also find it very problematic. And that thread starts from the very beginning. Thinking about the name Mount Everest, it's named after Sir George Everest, who's a British dude. He's a British white dude who Classic. showed up in the 1800s and was like, oh, there's mountains here. And so it they named it after him, although just in Sir George's defense, he did not think it should be called Everest because Everest cannot be written in Hindi, nor is it like pronounced in the native languages in the region. So he didn't really think it should be named after him, but the British people were like, oh my goodness, this British dude discovered this mountain that was already there and people knew about for many, many millions of years. So questionable. Yeah, shocking. Yeah. I mean, that's what a British explorer loves in life. Oh, is this Machu Picchu? Oh, I wonder why no one knew it existed before. Oh, just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. Everyone did. We just want to name it after ourselves. Yeah. So... The Nepalese called Everest Sagar Matha, which it translates to mean forehead of the sky, which I think is really beautiful. And the t- <laughs> yeah, forehead of the sky. I, as a big forehead lady, I just think the poetic forehead of the sky maybe if it was like diamond of the sky or like diamond in the rough or literally like anything but you're like oh so foreheads are so beautiful yeah have you ever seen a good shiny forehead wow an expansive forehead just no (laughs) it could be way more beautiful okay like i have another name for you then then i think you'll like the tibetan name it's Chomolukma Chomolukna Ma And it means goddess mother of the mountains Okay so there we go (laughs) They aptly named The tallest mountain in the whole world Yes However this is another Just like little sidebar It is the world's tallest mountain Depending where you measure it from and yeah. this is like a very nerdy distinction. So, well, how tall is it? Mount Everest stands just over 29,000 feet above sea level. Mm-hmm. But according to the article, if you want to be a pedantic jerk about it, and we probably do. <laughs> no, only I would like to make a note that only Jen ever does. <laughs> <laughs> it is not technically the tallest mountain. So it's either Hawaii's mountain, which is Mauna Kea, Mauna Kea. So that is taller because there's a lot of mountain under the sea. And Mm. Everest is also beaten by a mountain in Ecuador, Chimborazo. But basically, in general, Everest is really tall. Well, and there's also, like, mountains under the ocean that are bigger than Everest, Mm -hmm. like, in the trenches of the Pacific. But I don't – I don't think it should count if your mountain is half underwater because then it doesn't look as big. Well, see, that's what they're saying. The mountain in Ecuador, if you measure from the center of the Earth, because the Earth is in a – Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) We're getting real specific here. 
<laughs> so because the Earth isn't a perfect sphere, apparently Ecuador sits farther from the core center of the Earth than Nepal. So if you measure from the center of the Earth, the mountain in Ecuador is a okay, lot taller. Okay, I literally <laughs> hate the people that did this fact. They were just like so like just wanted to play devil's advocate and be like so annoying <laughs> they're just like the oscars from the o- the office they're like um actually and they probably correct grammar <laughs> they they absolutely do oh so the worst. let's just say there are a few people in the world uh annoying minority who will say Oh, but actually, Everest isn't mm-hmm. the tallest if you measure from the center of the Earth. Yeah. And, and we will say Pfft, to them. Oh, what's it like having no friends? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what we would say to them. That is exactly what we would say. You may be right, but you're all alone, <laughs> yeah. so suck it. <laughs> In the last 26,000 years, so again, some ancient history, Everest has grown roughly a mile in height. And apparently it's about half an inch a year because of the like continual shifting of the plates. So it's growing taller. So if you want to climb Everest now, it's the shortest it's ever going to be. So yeah. So get on it. You know, those inches start to add up. So again, leaping forward in time, Everest has attracted many climbers and mostly highly experienced mountaineers in the early days. So there were two main climbing routes. There's the standard route, which is the one through Nepal. And then there's a northern route, which is through Tibet. And there are technical challenges both ways, but apparently the northern route is more technically difficult. And there's some political difficulties. So most people do use the southern route. When we think about the famous Everest people, the earliest summits allegedly were, guess, Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians. Incorrect. Really? No. <laughs> <laughs> they were our favorite colonizers, the British. Yes. <laughs> So the first recorded summits of Everest were made by British mountaineers the first attempt that was recorded was in 1921 they reached 7,000 meters then the next year they got to 8,000 meters which was historic because that was the first time humans climbed above 8,000 meters so that's a big deal and then in 1924 the biggest mystery of evident Everest On this day, June the 8th, George Mallory and Andrew Irvine ascended up Everest, never to be seen again. Again. Until they brought down his body. Until they found the bodies. (laughs) Uh, So essentially, this is a big mystery because there's speculation that Mallory did summit and then died on the way down, which would make this the very first official summit. Uh, but it's uncertain. Nobody really knows what happened in the final moments, but they did find Mallory's body and the camera that he had remains lost, which is one of the mysteries because the camera would be that definitive proof about whether or not they were the first but we still don't know. We don't know. So fast forward another. Wait. Oh, <laughs> he is like the most famous for saying he wanted to climb the mountain because it's there. Yeah. Which, which is like, okay. I know we talked about this that we really both like it, but it also has this like petulance to it. Like if you're a teenager and you're like, why are you doing that? You're like, I, cause I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do it (laughs) that's exactly what it is it is like simultaneously inspiring and petulant so yes that's a good quote in general yeah okay so then we're gonna fast forward another 30 years approximately to a very famous Everesters duo what are their names 
Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. Tenzing Norgay. So they are the first official recorded summit of Everest. And this was in a year. 1953. 1953. Correct. Correct. And it's a big deal because they are the first official ascent. Uh, New Zealander Hillary was named as Time Magazine's one of the 100 most influential people of the 20th century. So kind of a big deal. And that is was like a, a major milestone kind of proving that it is possible. And I think another really important significant milestone is the summit of Reinhold Mesner who is one of the all-time greats in terms of mountaineers. And he is the first person alongside his teammate, Peter Habler, to submit the mountain without the use of supplemental oxygen. This is in 1978, and it's a really big deal. And I actually think that this whole without supplemental oxygen might be one of the ways that we can resolve some of the issues of Everest, of if we just require people to do it without supplemental oxygen, because only <laughs> a small fraction of people are able to do it. Something like... Yeah, apparently it's 3%. Yeah, so if only the top 3% of climbers are able to do it, because you have to be really skilled and in peak physical condition, and I feel like we could resolve so many of the issues we're going to talk about on Everest <laughs> if we just were just like, no oxygen is allowed! by the way. <laughs> Except for Sherpas. Sherpas are allowed oxygen, but no one else is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we should make the rules, basically. Yeah. Basically, we should be in charge. <laughs> okay. So we talked about the famous people. Um, and for decades, I mean, I'm sure people were interested after Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay climbed it because why wouldn't you be but the governments of nepal and tibet actually denied access to most foreign climbers and even throughout the 1980s access was limited to everest for one everest permit for foreign climbers per season so like basically no one um could go but everything really changed in the early 1990s and the kind of like these really famous mountaineers and adventurers rob hall and scott fisher convinced nepalese officials to expand foreign access and they actually set up their own business to bring people to climb everest and that's i think the start of the commercialization of mount everest because even in into thin air which is in 1997 and his book famously is about the deaths of eight climbers including these two guys who started rob hall and scott fisher who died in 1996 but he even mentions it so literally within like six years the commercialization had started to take effect so all of a sudden in the 90s like anyone with money could hire a professional mountaineered with sherpa support and have a chance to reached the summit and in the last 20 years Everest has seen a nearly 10 times increase in traffic with more than half of the 10,055 summits in happening within the last decade and this was in 2019 so two half of the summits were have been between 2009 and 2019 so like from 1953 to 1999 there is 1,159 summits and then In the 20 years after that, there was almost 9,000 summits. So crazy. Just legitimately crazy. By the mid-2000s, there was over 50 exhibition companies go up. There was about 500 people. And that really famous photo of them waiting to go up the Hillary steps is 876 people in a traffic jam. And it caused 11 fatalities. Because you obviously run out of very precious oxygen. It's insane. It's crazy. But the thing is, like, Nepal is one of the poorest countries in the world. And 10% of Nepal's GDP overall is tourism directly related to Mount Everest. So, like, that's why, like, they, even with, like, all these, like, growing concerns of fatalities, the Nepalese government has 
it's very hard to put a cap on the treks. Yeah, so if it's 10% of the GDP, like how much are Sherpas getting? And so the the market price of Everest packages goes anywhere from like 35,000 to 160,000, but the average western company is 66,000 US dollars. And it's like all fees by the government. So it's like 11000 per climber for a permit, 3000 for some liaison officer, 3000 for icefall doctors, 2500 fee for something, $4,000 garbage deposit. And then climbers roughly spend between ten to 15000 on gear. So like obviously your full suit, boots, crampons, sleeping bag, like airfare, evacuation sat sat phone that kind of stuff and you'd think like when you hear those numbers how much money people make well sherpas make about five thousand a year which is compared to the average nepalese income of 700 year is quite good and then i was like well but how much do like western companies make and you're like companies actually only make 10 percent 10 to 20 percent margins so on a climb they make somewhere between 7k and 14k on each climber but that's before taxes and before like any administration so like anything to like run your business they actually don't it's just crazy expensive and they're definitely like i mean i obviously 7k a climber is more than 5,000 a year a sherpa makes but it's not as like lucrative it's just as you'd expect it's just insanely expensive to do this stuff yeah but i think that the question is it's when we think about how this should be priced i think that we've gone at it a little bit backwards because in a way when we think about the disasters that have happened in the numbers of sherpas who have died on everest and the amount of risk that they have to take on. So there's places on the climb that they're passing through multiple times in ascent to right, bring yeah, the yeah. gear up. And how much should we pay we're ba- to buy someone's life, basically? It's really questionable. I think that's 100% true. I just think it's, it is super expensive to just do. And the, they're and they're definitely not getting paid enough but it's like when you say it's like 66,000 you're like you're the cost is broken down a lot of it goes to the government a lot of it goes to like just doing the climb and then t- if 10% goes to the company yes ha- of course they should pay like it's all like from that sherpa doc right like of course they should have labor rights and all of that stuff and and a sherpa is the most dangerous job in the world and the second most dangerous job was to be in the american military in iraq and it was still four times more dangerous to be a sherpa and you're like but i mean it even it kind of brings up so this this other thing that's been happening on Everest and in the last five years, like Sherpas who are tired of being the middleman and kind of not making the money have launched their own expedition companies and undercut the Western guides. But then there's so many more issues with that. So like they're because I I don't know if it's just because it's a focus on money, but like the average Nepali run company charges 38,000 per climber, which is 40% less than a Western guide. And you're six times more likely to die if you go with them. And you're like, okay, so we're problematic on all sorts. But then when you think about the treatment of the Sherpas in the Western led, like oh, it's yeah. been, again, problematic from the start. This idea that the Sherpas would just do whatever asked with a smile sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like, even on this one Nepalese website, it says they'll take anyone with a strong economic background to compensate (laughs) for old age or fear of risks. And I was like, so they're literally taking anyone. So in contrast to what we were saying about the strong mountaineering skills that were required in the initial summits of Everest, now it's your main qualification is a strong economic background, which brings the question, does it even count as climbing Everest if you have a team of people that are necessary to shepherd you to the top to carry literally the air that you will breathe? 
and they do all of that work. They set up your tent for you. They prepare your food. They have the tea waiting for you when you're coming down from a day of yeah. climbing. Like, does it really count if if you are not really? Yeah, you're like you're not like doing any of the doing- work. <laughs> I mean, I still think it probably counts, but it's still an extreme physical feat. But I think that's why, like, there's so many problematic things from labor to the amount of garbage on Everest to the amount of bodies on Everest, like, all of the stuff that, like, even most professional climbers, actual serious climbers, don't, won't climb Everest. And they just say it's, like, a tourist mm-hmm. route. And so they, there hasn't been a lot of serious professional climbers climbing Everest. They won't climb it anymore. Which Kind of makes sense. Like it's been done. We've we've done it, guys. I don't know if you knew, to, but we did it. We've climbed Everest. We did it. Like maybe climb something else. Yeah. Leave it alone. There's just this like wave of. There's so many problems right now, and unless we find a better solution for some of these really major problems. Like you were saying, the amount of bodies on Everest. Mm-hmm. So one of the sections is called Rainbow Valley, and that's because it's full of corpses and everyone's climbing in really brightly colored gear. So you can see all of this brightly colored down jackets and climbing equipment that are still on the bodies that lie in this valley. And... Basically, it's these climbers and they're just frozen in place. And there's a really famous one that's called Green Boots. Mm. And it's like a landmark that people go by. And it's an unnamed climber, Green Boots, who his body is still there. And you can just see these green boots. And it's this like very grim landmark for people that are climbing the north face yeah and apparently it costs 70k that's a like roughly how much it costs to get a body of everest so (laughs) yeah pretty significant and of course our very favorite thing which is making bodies become uncovered is global warming the ice is melting at such a rate that before they would just get covered with snow or fall down an ice crevice or whatever and you couldn't see them and now there's almost 250 bodies lining the path to the summit because of because of ice melting and now and like they're there god how can you climb when you're like all this these people it's dead pretty pretty grim yeah and then our other favorite thing to talk about poop poo and every year there's eight thousand kilos of poo on the mountain. It's a go ahead. Poo catastrophe. It's a poo catastrophe. An epidemic. Yeah, an epidemic. <laughs> That's the best one. But it's becoming such a problem that, and I didn't think of this. I was always thinking like, "Ha ha, there's poo," and then laugh at the poo. But because you're also not carrying water up a mountain, you're just boiling snow and drinking that. They can't boil snow in some of the camps now, like Camp Two. Last year, or I guess not last year, 2019, 10 Sherpas got like so sick because they boiled snow that had shit in it. (laughs) Yeah. And you're like, that is so bad. There's so much problematic stuff. Yeah. It's a, it's been described as a fecal time bomb. I mean, also a a good one. We have so many good ones for this one. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's literally a mountain of shit right now. It's disgusting. And there is a fee. Apparently, you're charged by the government. But it's garbage only. thousand pounds for garbage. So there should be a poo tax. They really should be, like, having to do the carry it out with you sort of poo tax. Well, and there's some mountains in South America where the governments require you have those wag bags. Mm -hmm. So you have to carry after a certain, like after you hit a certain amount of feet, you have to carry your poo out. And I was like, but there's no rules and that $4,000 doesn't count. It's only garbage. Yeah. And I actually think that in, if you're hiking in the Grand Canyon, you also need to carry your poo out. Like there's a lot of places that are fragile mm. ecosystems that there are rules in place that you have to carry out your poo and pee. Yeah. And it makes sense because these are really delicate, fragile ecosystems that really can't support this poo catastrophe. 
So I guess the big question, Jennifer, would you ever climb to Mount Everest Base Camp? Knowing all of these things, you're going to say yes. I know you're going to say yes, and you can't say yes. I think I would be really conflicted, but I think I would really like to go to the Himalayan mountain range because I love mountain. And I don't think I necessarily need to be at the foot of the goddess mother of the mountains staring at her shiny forehead. I don't like I think knowing what I know at this point in time I think that I would really struggle it still does have this pull and this lure because it's such a big deal but the fact that it has this buzz around it is why it's so problematic now why all of these issues are coming up because if there was some sort of systems put in place to deal with the environmental impact and to actually deal with the human rights impact that this has been having, then it wouldn't be that problematic, but it also would probably be very, very expensive. And it should be. I was like, if you you had 100K to just throw away, would it be on Everest? I don't think so. I I think think I would. What would I do with 100K? Travel-wise, if you had 100K for a trip, what would you do? Well, I would just travel as long and far as yeah. I can yeah I don't think I would blow it on one thing I think I would no, no I would definitely no, no. go to the Galapagos Island for some diving obviously and then I would just oh I'd go to Antarctica yeah that was the other thing on the list the very expensive hang out with the pinguinos yeah. my favorite yeah I'd go to Easter Island oh, yeah um I'd go to the Maldives definitely and I'd want to stay there for a month at least and just Live the yeah. Maldivian life. Yeah, I would definitely. I go to Madagascar. Yeah, yeah. hang out with the Bumafu. Yes, <laughs> he's a lemur. Oh yeah, and he leaps, leaps, he sleeps, sleeps, sleeps. sleeps. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and also I don't know that I would cope very well with being very cold. And and at have you ever been at altitude? Not real really. Altitude? Not like real, real altitude. And I think I wouldn't be great at it well let me tell you it sucks (laughs) i don't i don't know how to describe it other than it just sucks to be at altitude i don't know anyone unless you're like bolivian nepalese if you're you know if you're like born at those altitudes Mm -hmm. and it's in your blood we are you are born at negative sea level yeah well no not you specifically but your ancestors yeah you would not fare well. I don't think I have, I don't have that natural athleticism. But yeah, I think my answer is it'd be tempting, but I think that there's many other trips I'd go on before base camp. Yeah. Do you want to go to base camp? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, I would like to see That's it, the- but I think knowing all the pl- problematic stuff, I wouldn't want to do it. Okay. Some days to celebrate. Yeah. We have, well, it's July 10th today, so that's what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Nikola Tesla. Woo! We're a big fan. He made the Tesla. Invented... No, <laughs> but he invented electricity and alternating current. We know these things from drunk history. So, yes. Famously died on July 12th, which is hopefully the day we're going to release this. Mm hmm. Alexander Ham- Hamilton. Alexander and, Hamilton. Yeah, from Aaron Burr, sir. That's who murdered him. And this is Lisa's favorite musical? Yeah, I'd probably say so. I haven't I seen it yet, favorite. which is Oh my god, shocking. it's so good. <laughs> I mean, I would you should probably only see if you win tickets cuz they're expensive. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yes, it was very good. And then the only th- other thing I know that happens these days is uh, July 12th is Orange Men's Day in Northern Ireland. So basically in celebration of the Protestant mm. and the British. That seems like a very tense day. It's a celebration of problematic things in Northern Ireland. But yeah, that's my list. That's a good list. I have a few other things that you could celebrate if uh, thinking about Everest isn't your thing. On the 12th of July, you can celebrate Simplicity Day, which just seems very lovely and necessary. It is also, these are two of my favorite 90s kid things, 
It's etch a sketch day. Oh, cool. And eat your jello day. Gotta love jello. Ideally, you should have some jello jigglers and your etch a sketch, and it would just be, you know, the best day. Yeah. Great day. Good day. Okay. Well, I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. Bye. These are the days, my friends. The hour I send the sends that sing and dance and make a bunch of noise. So let the fun ensue and learn a thing or two. These are the days. Oh,